So my name is James Klein. I'm from Hyper, and uh, we are building out uh, multi-tenant secure container platform. Um, first, we're actually what we what we really have built is a virtualized container. So I know it's kind of ironic, but here's the agenda. So going over container as a service today, the end goal of what we're trying to actually accomplish with container as a service. Um, how it's implemented right now, uh, what is Hyper, what do we do, uh, how it works, and what our vision is for the next generation of container service, and Hypernetes, which is our multi-tenant Kubernetes distro. So how did we get here? So going back to actually his talk on how applications are becoming more and more complex, we actually started off with something technology-wise hypervisor virtualization technology. It's been around for over uh, 15 years now. And the whole purpose of that is cost reduction. Right, right now, we're getting into all these, you know, how to deploy these very complex apps, how to manage them, how to uh, scale them. At first, it was all about just consolidation and reducing costs and higher utilization. And then we thought, okay, well, that's great, but that's all manual. How do we, how do we automate this? So then we created infrastructure as a service, right? Developers can spin up their own virtual machines and launch their new ideas, test it out. It's all about automation. It's all about making the data center um, pliable and, and usable in a way that it wasn't so manual. But we're still talking about machines. We're still talking about servers here. And developers, they don't really want to manage servers. They want to manage applications. They want to develop applications. And so then they thought, okay, well, let's abstract away from that. It's good pass, right? That'll solve our problems. So they focused on app development. They, they abstracted away from the infrastructure and the details around that. The downfall of pass started about six years ago was that it, once you started building your application on someone's platform, you had to stick with their platform. And they were very opinionated on what they would allow and what they wouldn't allow. And so Docker came along and containers, and it was all about packaging and portability, right? So it solved the pass problem. But it did nothing about a lot of the infrastructure and the security aspects. It was just about portability and immutability. And now Container as a Service is taking Docker and taking it to the next level and saying, let's create a new type of platform, right? At Hyper, we're, we're focused on the end goal of, OK, well, if we're going to keep reinventing the wheel, why don't we focus on what we're actually trying to accomplish here? And if you talk to any CIO, any CFO, he wants to enable value creation, right? If he's going to adopt the next generation thing, whatever it is, you're going to have to accelerate his developers time to market, right? You're going to have to enable them to be self-service, meaning minimizing ops. You're going to have to ensure the security. So Docker's inherent risk there, or inherent problem, is that you have a shared kernel. So you're sharing it across uh, many different containers. So security isn't as secure as a hardware virtualization that you're used to. It's been matured over 15 years. You, you want to have to reduce risk, right? So that's app portability. So that's containers. That's where containers fit. Right? They reduce the risk of being locked into any one platform. In multi-cloud strategy, you're already seeing that play out, right? And most enterprises now have are using two or three different clouds. So you, the next generation CAS has to be enabling that. And then we have to enable lower costs, right? We have to minimize ops. So that's just a given. If you actually even want to get your foot in the door on what the next generation CAS is, and, and if enterprises want to adopt it, or if any developer even wants to adopt it. So this is CAS today. And so our problem with how it's being done right now, so say you're building out your container solution on top of AWS, is that COE is Container Orchestration Engine. That's Kubernetes, it's Swarm, it's whatever. Mesos, and you have your infrastructure as a service at the bottom, and you have your VMs, your cluster of VMs, your containers sitting inside of those, right? So automatically, you have to do capacity planning. You have to, you have to build out a, a pre-built pool of VMs, right? So now you have to start thinking about, all right, well, what are all the instant types I'm going to need for my containers? Right? What is the storage setup going to look like? What's the SDN going to look like? Uh, and this gets into, okay, what if I have a database container and a web container? Database container might require more memory, more disk space. 
whereas a web container might be uh, more CPU. So you're automatically now saying, all right, so I'm going to create two different instance types, VM instance types, for those containers specifically. So now I probably have a pretty good idea of where these things are going to land before I even start using a container uh, orchestration engine. Right? So now you have the problem of you already know the scheduling result before you see the schedule. Right? And this all leads to is low utilization of resources. You have a pool that's going to be idle. You have these long-running uh, VMs that are always going to have to be out there. You're always going to be paying for it to then start loading your containers in. So that's one of the major problems that we see. The other major problem is that you have two management plans to manage. Right? You, you still need to manage your infrastructure, so that hasn't gone away. You still need to figure out what instant types, the SDN, the storage, to manage all that. You, know, you still have to manage the containers, right? You have to manage the application itself. So the orchestration, service discovery, uh, discovery whatever, whatever that goes along with that. And this leads to nesting. And so now you have to nest your SDN your container network into your virtual machine network, uh, SDN. Uh, so that's harder to build, harder to manage, and harder to debug. And you're nesting your storage. So how do you do persistent storage and persistent volumes on the AWS right? set? You have Flocker on top of your EBS volumes. So this is two different management planes, two different layers of complexity that you now have to manage just so you can start using containers. Right. So what is Hyper? We came at it um, basically saying the last 15 years has been a lot of great technology that's been developed and matured. Let's create a VM that looks and feels like a container. And so we have a hypervisor agnostic Docker runtime. That's our long term for what we actually created. What we call it is we call it a hyper container. It's basically your Docker image running directly on a hypervisor. And we can run on any open source right now uh, hypervisor. So we support KVM, Zen, VirtualBox, ESX, we're in the process of supporting. So, yeah. And this is, we've mapped it directly to the Docker workflow. So our commands are the same as Docker's. So if you know Docker, you know us. And what you get out of this is you get the security of VMs, but you get the speed of containers. And I'll get into why you get the speed of so we can actually boot a container in 200 or a hyper container in 200 or 300 milliseconds. So how does this actually work? So this is the host, it's the big white, and then at the bottom here you have your images, your Docker images. And you pull them off onto the actual physical host. And then we have a, a hyper container, which is the gray. And inside that we have running, there's no guest host. So on the outside, this looks like a VM, a hyper container. But there's actually no guest OS inside. We have a very minimal optimized Linux kernel that runs. It's not a full OS. And all this use, this hyper kernel, is there to start to run the hyper start. And our hyper start is our micro init service. And this service uh, is there to load your Docker images basically into the hyper container. And we've orchestrated and designed this around pods, the concept of pods. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Kubernetes, but you can put multiple containers inside of a pod. And so we've actually aligned with that strategy as well. And we uh, segregate or isolate your, your images with mount namespace. So you don't see each other through that test inside of a pod. You can also just run one uh, image inside of a hyper container as well. You can do either, either or. So we're trying to bring the best of both worlds here, right? We have containers, traditional containers, we have our hyper container, we have our VM. So we, we provide strong isolation because it's hardware enforced isolation. We're using a hypervisor. It's portable because it's your Docker image, you can take it anywhere. And we support multiple hypervisors, multiple formats, right? Where a typical VM can't run a, a VM, a KVM instance on, say, VMware. Right? And boot time are almost just as fast as a container, whereas VMs you know, minutes boot time. Uh, same thing with image size. So our overhead is uh, our hyper container image is like 25 megabytes, a little bit less, and then whatever your Docker image is. And then uh, the VM is typical with tens of megabytes, right? Um, and it's immutable, it's just your Docker image inside. 
uh, whereas a VM, you have a whole ecosystem built around managing that guest OS inside that VM. Right? You have your Puppet Chef and all those configuration management tools. Uh, compatibility, this is all about uh, um, if you already have the infrastructure and service built up, right, then you have a tool chain problem. And so you probably want to reuse as much as possible. Because we're a hypervisor based, we can support a lot of different tool chains that have already been built up. Uh, in terms of maturity, uh, we're using hypervisors, so we're actually pretty, pretty mature. Um, and then in terms of bring your own kernel, so this is actually very important in a public multi tenant environment. You want, uh, you want people to uh, have the option of, of loading in their own kernel, their kernel modules, and running them, uh, whereas containers is a shared kernel model. And then ROI, in terms of ROI, uh, what happens if someone has an infrastructure as a service that OpenStack builds up? What do they want to do if they want to start running containers? Right? Typically leads to they're building everything on top of it and it's splitting, it's custom, it's, it's trying to shoehorn everything in. And so this is what it, what it looks like today. And what we're really proposing is to make it look like this. So whereas at the top you have your Kubernetes, well that's going to become the foundational uh, orchestration engine. And so there's no pre-built VMs being launched. You just have your hyper container, your Docker image, and it's launching it as your application needs it to launch. And it's fully isolated, hardware isolation. And so what we did is we created our Hypernades, which is basically, we're because we're hypervisor based, uh, we went out there and we saw what is the best of breed. Uh, tools that we can use, right? So we're using Cinder Set for storage, we're using Neutron for SDN, Keystone for authentication. Uh -huh. But we're using our Hyper uh, runtime uh -huh. instead of Nova. And so, because Nova is designed for long running uh, VMs, where this is actually it's containers. And then we have Kubernetes Master, a single Kubernetes Master uh, running for all tenants. Um, so that's the orchestration engine launching the different Hyper containers. And where we're taking this is, we're actually at the end of this month, we're, we're launching, uh, oh, all this is open source. So our hyper, our, our base um, technology is open source, our Hypernetis is open source. Um, Hypernetis is actually being um, integrated into Kubernetes in 1.4. Uh, hyper, um, we've submitted it to the OCI group, the CNCF group uh, for spec, so we can run. We actually, um, our hyper technology is, we call it uh, Run V. So if you guys know Docker, Run C, we've submitted Run V into, into the OCI. So you can actually run like your hypervisor or on the traditional Docker. But what it's getting to is that we're actually launching, at the end of this month, we're launching a private beta. And we're taking our hyper and we're building that out. And the focus with this is not microservices. And the reason why is, most people are not there yet. They're not, they're not capable of managing that much complexity. They want to get their heads wrapped around containers first, and then start breaking their applications into smaller pieces and them. So what we're really focusing on is the individual developers first. And so we're trying to give you the same Docker workflow that you currently have. And so we're trying to eliminate uh, dev, pod uh, differences. So we're giving you parity. And what will happen is you will actually download our CLI, which will basically be the Docker CLI, except for saying Docker run, you say hyper. And when you're building and launching your images, you're launching on the cloud, not launching on your laptop. But it looks and feels like you're on your laptop. And so you're giving security as uh, secure as virtual machines, with isolation with all your containers. Uh, and you're getting hyper elastic, right? So we have sub-second boot times. And you, there's no over-provisioning of resources. So you don't have VM pools that you're spinning up to launch your containers. And you're just launching right then and there the containers that you need and can specify your application. Uh, the different loads and, and, and it spikes, then the launch more containers. Right, you get persistent storage out of the box. And this is pretty cool. We get the, you know, all redundancy uh, distributed. You can do snapshots. And if the uh, container fails, it automatically fails over and relaunches it, attaches the volume to it. Uh, and then we're doing it on a pay per second. And the reason why we're doing pay per second, what this means is, 
we want all the different use cases from traditional just VPS, like I want just a server and I want one container, one application, all the way to serverless models where you're doing like AWS Lambda type stuff, where you need something to run and it's up for a second and it's down. Right? So because we can accommodate this from the technology perspective, we want to actually accommodate this from the building perspective as well. So we want to see everybody to whatever your use case is and whatever you're trying to accomplish, uh, you can do it through this. It's very simple and very easy. So you can actually go to hyper.sh right now and put your name in and sign up. Um, so yeah, so I don't have a demo for you today. I apologize. Our CTO was supposed to accompany me on this trip. Um, but we're pretty actually we're very excited about this. Uh, we think it's going to help a lot of developers just getting used to launching their containers in production very quickly, uh, in the same fashion that they're launching and using containers on the platform. That's it. So let's first take a look at the competition. Uh, Microsoft launching the similar thing. You can launch either a, a yep. container in a container or a container in a hypervisor. Yep. VMware is launching the similar thing where you run it inside a container, uh, inside a VM. So it's in and there is ClearOS from uh, Linux, from uh, Intel. Yep. So how do you compare to those competitors? We're very similar to clear containers and what Microsoft architecturally what they're doing. And we're already talking with VMware. They're about, they actually came to us when we launched this mid last year to say how, how are you guys doing this? And so they have some things that they do like um, instant clone. We can do that. We actually do it better than they do. They take like three hundred milliseconds and we take twenty five milliseconds okay. yeah. um, But that's the storage also. And this is like instant clone of your container. In memory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, it's all along the same lines. Intel's not commercializing this though. Yeah. They're only doing partnerships. They did something with CoreOS. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't expect, they want to push hardware at the end of the day. Correct. That's all they want, that's what they want to push. Um, some other things that we're working on is supporting ARM. Like this. Yeah. So that's, Competitive advantage and also gives different CI CD build models, right? People who want to you know, build applications for whatever, um, they can run them on. Um, telcos are actually looking at on for uh, NFE workloads. So we're talking to a number of telcos. Um, yeah, and Microsoft, it's obviously Microsoft, it's a, it's a different kernel yeah. together, um, and they'll do their own thing. Okay, the next one. Join. Yeah, so that's Solaris. Yeah. Is it less secure? No, I wouldn't say it's less secure. Yeah, they have a translation layer in the middle. Right? You do. You have a hardware translation layer. Well, they have actually going from Solaris to Linux. Yeah, yeah. Containers. Yeah. Very thin layer. Not hardware. Right. Virtualization. Yeah. Um, I mean, they were, the, they were pioneers in terms of LXC and doing that. Uh, and now they're trying to make theirs more portable and usable. So they're doing good stuff. We're always, we're talking to them as well. Um, I can't get into the nitty gritty on what the technical details are. But. Okay, and then how would you compare the security model of uh, LXD and maybe CoreOS now coming up and, and uh, what, what Docker is doing? To uh, to well the the number of uh, vulnerabilities you see, for example, in Xen or in others, they also have their vulnerabilities. The core was in. No, I mean Xen has. They have several several CVs and yes, several times per year. You have to do have vulnerabilities, but in the larger context, they are much smaller uh, attack surface than your typical. OS. Correct. And so we think that this is, hypervisor has been battle tested for the last 15 years. If you go to any CIO and say, take this new core OS, run everything on it, 
or take KBM certified by Red Hat, which do you think you're going to trust? Right? Mm -hmm. Which is battle tested. And so, yeah, the models might be, they might catch up very quickly, but we're taking the approach of let's reuse what people already have and what people know. It's, it's partly uh, technology adoption, it's partly um, people, right? You, you got to make sure that uh, there's a pace at which someone can actually utilize this technology mm -hmm. without the risk factor. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're really trying to get at, is that we think that there's um, other things, other factors in making the decision of what technology you're going to adopt, how you're going to use it. So the focus of the public cloud offering is more directly target at developers and making their lives easier. The tech underneath it will be less and less marketing that because at the end of the day, if we can, if we can prove that we are secure, that we're very easy to use, then people just use it. They won't, they won't really dive into, well, how do you do this and how do you do that? As long as it's, it's, it aligns with the, the major players in the industry, Docker and containers and everything else, and, and all the commands that you can use in those ecosystems that I think we're, we're set. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of cool things that we're going to be doing with this uh, that we're not launching right at the, at the initial private beta, um, but uh, we want to gather feedback and prioritize what features that uh, the developers want. So can I deploy this on my own Hyper nowadays? Can I just download it and install it? You can download Hyper and Hypernatives. Uh, but the public, I mean, it's it's a. I would prefer to just go out and actually use the public uh, uh, data. But I can use it on premise. You could, yeah. You could. Thank you. Anything else? Cool. Thank you. <laughs>